I'll introduce the next couple speakers talking about organic industrial hemp. Leah Varek is my research technician, um, one of the our instrumental people in O-Grain and really is, is uh, the person that generates all the data and research that we're able to provide to you all. Um, and Brian Luck, uh, uh, assistant professor in the Department of Biosystems Engineering. So this was our first year as a UW research team moving into industrial hemp, be it organic and conventional, and they're going to present some of their observations um, and initial data with respect to how the system performed this year at our Arlington Research Station. So, Leah? Well, thank you, Erin, and thank you all for being here. I know there is a great session happening in the other room, and I'm kind of sad I cannot attend it, but that's why we have video recording, so you're going to be able to see both of them. Um, yeah, so organic industrial hemp. Um, I feel like every researcher here at the university who has some kind of field research had hemp growing in some kind of way. And the way we did it was to grow industrial hemp in organic system. So I'm not going to talk about CBD hemp production at all. And I think there are very distinct systems. And I don't think I know anything about CBD hemp production. But I know someone here in the front of the room, uh, Mark Dula. Mark, if you want to raise your hand, I'm putting you on the spot. So Mark grew quite a lot of CBD hemp this year. And, and I think he learned a lot uh, along the way. So. I don't know if any of you guys uh, grew any kind of hemp, CBD hemp or industrial hemp. Okay, so a little bit of experience. Um, so as I um, described the trial that we had this year at the Arlington Agricultural Research Station, I'm also going to try to give a little bit of more general information that I got from uh, Brian Parr, who works at Legacy Hemp, as well as Leah Sandler, who used to work at Michael Fields, but moved to Canada, so she cannot be here today, obviously. So this is the trial uh, description that we had this summer. So all of that was done in organic uh, land. And, and before I dig into the, the details, I wanted to give general information on um, starting with planting date. So what, what is recommended in terms of planting date for hemp, uh, at least here? would be um, May to early June, but do not go too late into June and not too early either, and I'm going to tell you why. So the reason why you don't want to plant too late is that hemp is photoperiod dependent, and so it's going to flower um, according to the day length. And I feel like there are two theories on it. So the literature says that it does flower around 14 to 16 hours of day length, but what has been observed here is that it starts to flower after the summer solstice no matter what. So it seems that it's the reduction in day length that's actually triggering the flowering of the hemp versus an actual number of hours. So it's, it's important because if, if it starts to flower at the end of June, you want it to have um, enough biomass out to be able to sustain the production of seeds. So you don't want to plant too late and have too little plants when they actually start to flower. So that's, that's why you don't want to plant too late. And the reason why you don't want to plant too early is that hemp um, doesn't like excess moisture. So you want to wait until your fields are nice and, and well drained, which can be the middle of August if you have a, a year like we had this year. Um, but really wait. And also hemp doesn't like uh, poor seedbed preparation. It doesn't like compaction or seed crust. Um, so it doesn't like, there, there's a lot of things that hemp doesn't like actually, but so really, really wait until you have a good seed, seed bed, uh, well-drained soil, and also it is pretty hard to control weeds in the early stages of development of hemp, so you really want to have a clean field, which again, um, it's, it's better to push the planting date a little bit for that. So in terms of what we tried, so we had two planting dates. The first one was May 15, and the second one was June 1st. Um, on top of that, we had two seeding patterns, so I, I'm calling plain uh, something that we planted on seven and a half inches with a drill. We actually planted everything with a drill, but, um, and then we had a, a row planting on 30 inches. And so what we wanted to try here is how much more weed control can we get on 30 inches by using a, a row cultivator. So on top of these two um, first factors, we also had weed control because we've heard a lot about hemp being a very good weed suppressor and not really needing any kind of weed control. So we had a no mechanical weeding, no weed control at all treatment. 
And then we had a mechanical weeding treatment that was, of course, adapted to the type of planting that we had. So the, um, the plain planted was tine wooded only, and the row planted was tine wooded and row cultivated. Um, so the variety that we used was X59 from Legacy Hemp, and I, I don't think we actually choose it, it's just kind of what we found. So it is a dual purpose variety, which means that you can get fiber and seeds from it. And, and the, the fiber that you get out of these dual purpose uh, varieties is not the high quality fiber that is used for clothing, but it's more the lower qui quality fiber that can be used for uh, concrete that is actually called hempcrete. Um, uh, for the seeding rate, we use 30 pounds per acre, which is what is recommended. But in terms of thinking of pounds per acre, it's better to think about number of plants per square feet. And in organic system, what is recommended is to plant 12 to 16 plants per square feet. And so if you think about what you want to have at the end, and, and what you start with your, your um, planting rate, you also have to take out a bunch of things. So um, the germ test is usually pretty low on hand. For us, it was 88 persons. So you have to know your test way you have to know your germ test, and you also have to take into account that there is a very high percent of seedling, um, um, seedling losses, seedling mortality in hemp, so 25 to 35 percent of the seedlings are actually not going to make it. So keep all of that in mind when you're trying to like, figure out your planting rate. In terms of depth, what's um, mostly recommended is half an inch. But it's been uh, seen in, in multiple uh, places where the ground is a little heavier, takes a little more time to uh, drain or get warmer, that half an inch can actually be too deep. So the shallower, the better, especially in, um, in heavy, cold ground. Uh, if you're on a sandy, uh, well-drained soil, you can go maybe half an inch, three-quarter of an inch, but um, don't, don't be afraid to really check after when you're planting that you're not burying the seeds because you really don't like that. And what happens if you plant it too deep is that the seedlings would start to emerge and they would actually rot before they get out of the ground. So as I already mentioned, we planted everything with a no-till drill. So for the 30 inches uh, treatment, we just uh, stopped some of the seed tubes from planting. Um, our plot size was, was 15 by 50 feet, and I think that's pretty important in our, in our trial because we, uh, hemp is very susceptible to field edges. It really doesn't like field edges, and it was um, amazing how obvious it was that the plants on the edges were actually kind of eroded by the wind, or I don't know exactly what was going on, but maybe I would recommend trying to plant a taller cover crop around the hemp to protect it from whatever is stopping it to grow from the edges. And finally, the previous crop was alfalfa, which also um, I would recommend going after alfalfa for two reasons. The first one is weed control, so you're going to get better weed control after a good stand of alfalfa, and you're also going to get nitrogen, so hemp requires quite a lot of nitrogen. Um, I think the general recommendation is 120 pounds per acre. It could be a little more, could be a little less, but that's kind of in that range. So I don't know if you see the picture so well, but um, as I told you, um, hemp uh, really likes to have a nice and clean seed bed. And so this is um, this picture here shows how um, the first planting date was. So the picture was actually taken on, on May 31st from the treatment that it was planted on, on May 15. And so what happened is that we wanted to like stick to the date and we rushed it and we planted in, in a condition that was pretty terrible where we still had crabgrass alfalfa in the field, we worried the field wet, and then we had rain after, so you see there is a nice good crust forming on the ground, so not good uh, planting conditions for our first planting date, which is why we decided to delay our second planting date a little bit. The, uh, the target was June 1st, but we waited um, another week to be able to work the field well enough uh, to plant in better conditions. Um, emergence. Um, Hemp emerges very, very slowly, so it will take seven to 14 days for the, the full stand to be out of the ground. And so what this picture here is showing, um, you see on the bottom, so this, is, this was for the first planting date, the early planting, and, and what you see here is uh, 15 days after planting. You see that some of the seedlings have true leaves already, 
and some of them here are very tiny, j just came out of the ground. So it really takes a while. And the dates that I wrote here are for the late planting dates. So we planted on, on June 6th, and then on June 14th, we did a stand count. And I would say 20% of the stand was out, out there on June 14th. So really takes a long time. And finally, most of the stand was out on June 12th, so 12 days after planting. And, and the, the hemp still like, kept coming until June 24. Um, so this is what we tried in terms of mechanical weeding. So we had never grown hemp before. And for the first planting date, we waited. So we were told that we should wait until the first true leaf. And that's how it looks like. So you can see this is first true leaf. So these are very tiny little plants. And on, on, the, on the left, you can see the set, two sets of true leaves. So even that is not a very big plant. So we tried to do some rotary hoeing and we saw that we were making way too much damage on the, on the hemp seedlings using the rotary hoe. And there is only so much adjustment you can make on a rotary hoe. So we used the tine weeder and we went as shallow as we possibly could. So I don't think we actually got a lot of weeds out of the system when we did it. Um, and that, that was it for the early planted uh, on seven and a half inches. We didn't do any other weed control on it because we didn't get a, a good chance to do it. But for the row planting, we, we did three passes of row cultivator after. And so that's, you see how we did a field was, so that's 30 days after planting, we had barely any weed control done before that. And then we, we did that first pass of cultivation. We went both ways um, to really get most of the weeds out. And I think it, I mean, it did an okay job, but we were really starting with a very really bad looking field. So second planting date, we had a little more experience with mechanical weeding on hemp, but really not a lot actually. So when came the first true leaf stage, we tried to do some tine weeding again, and we decided to get out of the field because we were doing too much damage on the, on the small uh, ham seeds, uh, ham seedlings. So I like to call that picture um, weeds one, ham zero. So you see a, there is like a, a plant, a ham plant here that's completely uprooted. And the other ones here are half buried. And the velvet leaf here is laughing at us. And this one is also laughing at us. So tine weeding is pretty pretty tough on, on hemp, and, and that's something that I want to try. I would not necessarily recommend trying it, but I would like to try to plant a little later and a little deeper to allow hemp to be uh, more deeply rooted so we could do a little more mechanical weeding on top of it. So I think that's something we're going to try next year, but it's not a recommendation, just something we want to try. Um, so again, we did... On, on this uh, late planted treatment, we did a little more mechanical weeding than on the other one, uh, both in the plain planted and on the roll planted uh, treatments. So that's 21 days after planting. The plants are not um, huge. So this is a, a drilled uh, seven and a half inches treatment. And you see how uneven the stand is. So probably due to that very high seedling mortality and also um, probably the, the depth that is hard to get at the, at the right depth. So the stand is, is not very even through the field. So this is our late planted treatment. So we, we started to cultivate when the plants were fairly small and I think it, it worked pretty well. You really have to go very slow, obviously. Uh, but if, if, you ha if you're starting with a nice seed bed, um, then you don't, you, know, you, you don't have like big clogs of ground that you're throwing on the, on the tiny little hand plants and it, it works fine. Uh, tine weeding 26 days after planting. I think that was probably a little ridiculous to even do it because we didn't get any weeds. As you can see, they were already way too big for a tine weeder, but we, we tried anyways. And we did a bunch of damage on the hemp here. You see this row is completely out. Um, so what did we find in terms of weed pressure? So the only from our three uh, different things that we were trying, the only thing that had an influence on the weed pressure was actually the row spacing. So on 30 inches, we had, so the, the treatments that are on top have the, the least weed pressure and at the bottom, the, the highest weed pressure. So 30 inches, lower weed pressure than seven and a half inches. And then the planting dates and the weed control didn't actually have any effect on the weed pressure. You see, here on the graph, 
everything that has the same letter, so all the A's here are now different from one another, and all the B's are now different from one another. But we, we have one best treatment for, for in terms of weed pressure that was 30 inches planted early with weed control, and the worst treatment was seven and a half inches planted late with weed control. So pretty interesting result here. Um, in terms of final stand, so as, as I told you again, um, all the all those things that you have to take into account to get that 12 to 16 plants per square feet. So we started with a test weight of 27,000 seeds per pound, germ test of 88%. We planted 30 pounds per acre, which means that we we had 17 viable seeds per square feet. And if you take this 25 to 35 percent seed mor mortality into account, in theory, we should have had 11 to 13 plants per square feet, which is, which is pretty good, which is what you want to have. And, and here is what we actually got. So uh, final stand was highly influenced by planting pattern. The, the hemp that was planted in 30 inches had a much better stand than what was planted in seven and a half inches. And my theory around that is that um, it's much more dense when you're planting um, on 30 inches because you have the same number of seeds per acre, right? But they're all close together and I think they're helping each other get out of the ground versus when you have seven and a half inches, they're kind of all spread out and they're having a hard time getting out of the ground. Um, planting late also gave us a, a better um, stand than planting early, probably because of the uh, field condition in which we planted when we planted early. And, and here, um, the best combination was to plant late on 30 inches. We, we had all the, all the seed that we planted actually came out. So this is um, something that we were observing walking the fields and also, so Brian Parr from Legacy Hemp um, visited uh, our fields one day and he was very surprised as to uh, the size of the hemp heads that we had and how diverse it was. So we, we have here obviously a very long uh, hemp head, which is, it's not supposed to look that way. And then we had much smaller ones. And so the, the diversity in size was so large that we decided to actually measure it. So this is any our undergraduate worker measuring our tallest uh, hemp head of the field. So the measuring stake that she has in her hands is 40 inches long. So that's, that's a massive head. It's not supposed to look like that. So we kind of wanted to see if um, our treatments had an impact on that. So we measured the full plant height, as well as the base of the head and the head length and also the stem diameter. And this is what we found. So uh, the planting date had an impact on plant height, uh, base of the head and stem diameter. So the, the plants that were planted earlier were taller, the head started um, higher and they also had thicker stems. Um, the planting pattern had an impact on the height of the base of the head as well as the head length. So the, the narrow planting gave uh, higher heads but also longer heads, so 11 inches, which is, I don't know what the average should be, but I think it's, it's pretty long. Um, and also the weed control had an impact on uh, the length of the head and the stem diameter and so that's something that has been observed is that early ceiling um, injury can cause uh, these very tall heads that we had. And we have no idea um, if it has any benefits in terms of yield. Uh, but it's been observed before uh, in fields that had been mechanically weeded or that had hell when uh, the ceilings were very small. Um, finally, uh, fungal diseases. So we, the, the picture on the right um, was, I don't know, midsummer, and that's how the fungal disease uh, starts to show up. So you see the top of the head is starting to desiccate. That's how it's supposed to look like, and that's how the infected plants look like. And, and that's at the end of the season, so it's, it's kind of hard sometimes, sometimes to differentiate a plant that is ready to harvest from a plant that's fully diseased. So this is a plant that is getting ready to harvest, this one as well. You see the leaves are desiccating around the head, and the one in the back here is a plant that's completely diseased. So that's, that's what we had. We, we took a bunch of sample and what we had in our field and a lot of other researchers had it at the research station was Fusarium rot. And I listed two other, white mold and gray molds. So they also have been observed 
um, in the upper Midwest, and, and they all look the same. So it's gonna be hard to identify which one you have in your field. You really have to turn in a sample to get it studied to know which, which kind of uh, fungal disease you, you have. So that can obviously have a huge impact if you're going for a food grade market. You may not get into it if you have uh, so much disease pressure. So in terms of yield, I was, I was looking at the, um, the yield that you can expect from the variety that we got, and I think the range was from 800 pounds to 2,000 pounds. So that's quite a, a large range that they're giving us. Um, here we were uh, below that, below the eight, at 800 minimum that they were giving, and I think, so one thing that was happening is that we had so many field edges that we had a high impact of that on our overall uh, yield of the, of the plot. And the only um, factor that had an impact on yield in our case was planting date. So the late planted treatments yielded better than the early planted treatments, and we had absolutely no influence of planting pattern or weed control on yield. Pretty surprising, especially um, if you remember all the, the weed pressure and, and plant size that we have went through before. Um, this is not something that I was expecting. Um, <laughs> something else that we tried, and it didn't work, so I would not recommend doing it. We planted hemp and spring planted rye, so if you want to know more about spring planted rye, I'm gonna talk about it this afternoon. But uh, briefly, we drilled uh, rye on May 31st, and um, so rye, when it does not vernalize, it does not go um, to reproductive stages, so it's gonna stay grassy as it is on the picture. Um, and we were doing it for soybeans anyway, so we decided to do it for hemp, and so we uh, planted um, hemp Five days later than the rye, we planted it on rows, and it, it looked great, I mean, it, do, it does look great on the picture here, but um, eventually all the hemp plants started to die, and I don't know what was happening here. I don't know if it just doesn't like competition, or if it's something uh, between the rye and the allopathic effect of the rye that's really affecting the hemp, but um, didn't work for us. Um, finally, the economics. Um, so the seed cost is pretty high, uh, for uh, four dollars a pound, um, but if you get in the food grade uh, market, you can you know you can make decent amount of money, um, 1.2 to 1.5 uh, dollar per pound. But there is no other market, so if you cannot get into the food grade market, basically you cannot do anything with your hemp seeds. There is no option for you, and you can you cannot even save your seeds to replant them because it's not a load because a lot of the seed is actually protected. So really, if you do not get that food grade market, there is no other option. Um, in terms of fiber market, it's, it is at the R&D stage, so really research and development, which means that it's not gonna be available if it ever is before two to three years down the road. So I would not plan on that. And finally, um, so I think it's not true in Wisconsin, but in some states, uh, the Department of Ag, um, considers uh, hemp stocks as not a load um, for bedding for cattle because they could be eating it <laughs> and getting high on, on the hemp stocks, basically. That was it for my part, and I'm gonna give it over to Brian Locke, who's gonna talk about how to harvest it. A lot of, a lot of missing details on our hemp work, um, and I will, I will say that due to the fact that we were really trying to focus on harvest. So mechanical combine harvest of hemp seed. Um, what I will tell you is that everybody I talked to and even my collaborator, Dr. Kevin Chenner, the BSE department, uh, farm crew, farm staff, anybody else, you're gonna burn an expensive combine to the ground is what everybody was telling me, okay? So with that in mind, please excuse the the when it came time to harvest, we harvested, all right? And, and everybody is not as scared. We're doing it again in 2020, so. Uh, but I do have some interesting stuff. So 13 acres of hemp was planted uh, within the UW system. Dr. Luck had 10 of it. I won, okay? 10 acres were planted in June, early June, shortly after Leah. I think she talked the research farm into doing hers first. Um, we did 15 and 30 inch rows with a drill at 21 to 22 pounds per acre. Uh, we did mechanical cultivation on the 30 inch rows. We didn't touch the 15s. Uh, I'll give you a little background on the field. Fall manure was applied. 
uh, and I believe Roundup was applied for brown down in the spring. So our treatments of this was not 100% organic. That said, beyond that Roundup treatment, we tilled it to bug dust, it rained, we tilled it to bug dust, it rained one more time and then planted it. Um, so after that, no more applications of anything except that mechanical cultivation, all right? So beyond uh, the early Roundup treatment, it was, was farmed sort of organically. I uh, went off the, off the rails. I did not get the X59 variety like everybody else did. I went to Canada and got one called Anka. Uh, Leia's plants were cute, but wait till you see mine. Hand harvested yield measurements in the fall, and then we did the combine assessment for grain harvest. Um, so I didn't get pictures early like Leia did, but this would have been around July 4th. Uh, so when we say knee high by the 4th of July, our general corn, that's what this was. Okay, so our hemp plants were knee high at least in early July, uh, planted somewhere around the second week of June, okay? Then there's what the mechanical cultivation looked like on 30 inch rows, so we made a pass through there as the plants were knee, knee to thigh high, you know, somewhere around that range on me. Um, from what we could tell at harvest, and I'll show you some pictures later, Basically, the mechanical cultivation took care of a lot of the weeds, canopy closed, and it was good after that. 15-inch rows did have some velvet leaf and other things in there, uh, but it wasn't so much that I would have been worried about, uh, worried about damage to the crop, okay? What does it say about a person that's walking around a hemp field and goes, that's an extension picture, okay? I'm not an entomologist, um, but I do know that's a Japanese beetle because one told me that's what it was. Um, we didn't notice a lot. I just put this up here to, to talk about insect pressure. So we didn't notice a lot. Um, there were Japanese beetles in there, but we couldn't tell that they were really damaging. It's not like what you see on a soybean leaf, right? When they get a hold of them, they just dec decimate the leaf. They weren't doing that to the hemp plants. Um, whatever they were doing, they looked like they were having a good time. So I'll let your mind go wherever you want it to there. Um, let's play a little game. Can we find Dr. Luck? Can I point here? See that ball cap right there? That would have been, uh, it says 125, 2020. That's not right, that's today. The, the, the date on that was July 26th when my uncle visited. That's why I know he took the picture. There's me walking into that mess. So one of the things I'll tell you from a harvest standpoint is we had a lot of variation in our crop height just like what Leah was talking about. Uh, but her plots were, you know, hip to chest high, and mine were 14 feet. Way, 12 to 14 feet by the time it's all said and done. So harvesting incredibly difficult in that situation because you don't have a level crop to be able to set your machine right at it and make it feed evenly. I'll show you some videos later on that. But uh, end of July, we had, you know, head high to me or a little better. Uh, here's the combine we used. Sorry for all the deer, gleaner, um, Kloss or what is it, Lexion fans in here, but we got the, we had a red combine. We didn't actually use that one, but the white lid, white hood uh, cab cover on that just makes me smile. It, it reminds me of the one we had on our farm. So uh, I will especially thank McDonough Industries for helping us out here. They let us use, uh, use one of their draper heads. It was not a flex, it was a rigid platform uh, to, to try to harvest this crop. So we had a sickle bar at the bottom, draper in the, draper in the middle trying to feed crop into the combine. Uh, this would have been sometime in September when we had our, or no, sorry, August, uh, when we had our hemp field day, just to show you kind of what that looked like. Pulled up everybody, and, and again, there's that goofy looking guy with the beard, um, talking about how we're planning on going about this, and you can see the group of people in the crop there to the side. We'll tell you that industrial hemp in 10 acres smells really nice when you, when you get near it. So now we're nearing harvest. We had, I won't talk about the disease or anything, but that uh, we did have some of the same situations where the head's desiccated, like Leo was talking about, with this variety as well. That's me and Dr. Drury in the crop there, hand harvesting yield. Um, it's not like sorghum or milo where you come out itchy. We didn't, it didn't bother me at all. Um, and you can see I'm kind of holding that camera about right here. So the, the crop height, obviously 12 to 14 feet in some cases uh, in the 15 and 30 inch rows, okay? Not the best picture here, but just the, the initial look at what the combine looks like going through there. Um, you can see over here, and I got some better pictures and video of it, but we are missing heads 
quite a bit with that combine. A couple reasons for that, and I'll go through them here in a minute. I think I have my combine settings in here. So 30-foot draper head, we had the real cam at setting one. We had short rock guards on there. Uh, the height setting was about 40 to 60 inches. You can tell my UAV training here, AGL above ground level. So 40 to 60 inches up was where the head was running at all times. Real height was set at or near the lowest setting, so we dropped it as low as we could to try to knock as much crop into that header as we possibly could. Uh, real speed was set at initially at ground speed, so matching ground speed, that didn't do any good because once that crop got cut and it was 14 foot, it just fell forward and went right on the ground. Okay, so we got it a little higher than ground speed to knock more of that crop into the machine. Um, the crop stalled on the header, reel, and cutter bar causing quite a bit of losses up front. So um, in between the where the where the reel was, we'd get material stuck in there, material stuck on the sides, and then just stuff falling straight out of the header was another issue that we ran into. I'll let you go through the, I'll go through these really quick, quickly. We had a Case I-6130, so that's not the combine I showed you in the picture initially. It's a 2012 model. Uh, we set up the feeder, feeder house drum at the upper position, so that would be a corn setting. A lot of people were talking to us about using small grain um, concaves, and we decided not to do that due to the, the how tough that rope is, the, the plant fiber is. Uh, so we used corn, corn settings basically for this. So feeder house gear was set on low. Threshing rotor speed was 430 RPMs. Concave clearance about 41 millimeters. Cleaning fan speed 950 RPMs. Upper sieve in the back was 8 millimeters. Lower sieve was 1 millimeter. Uh, the chopping rotor speed in the back, I'll go ahead and tell you right now, this was the important one. Set it to high. Um, and the chopper rotor, rotor knives were in the out position. And we'll, we'll show you a nice picture of that here in just a minute. Um, so some observations on what we learned when we ran the combine through this mess, pardon me, hemp, um, was wrapping on the chopping rotor. It happened twice, okay? Um, we had the chopping rotor set at its medium setting, so you get within the cab and that did not cut the hemp fibers when it was coming out the back. So uh, to, to pardon my French here a little bit, but to, to put a phrase on it, my tractor see, team says run it WFO, and that's wide frickin' open. Um, so turn that all the way up so it will chop the material. I'll show you some videos on once we got it figured out. We did see wrapping within the machine. So we saw it on the feeder house slats. Uh, the cleaning fan shafts, inboard support bearings, and inboard of the feeder house drive shaft. Um, the material did maintain, remain loose on all of those places uh, until excessive material was loaded up on there, okay? So when you got too much material, that's when it tightened up and really became, you know, a, a friction issue. This was over the whole 10 acres as well. So once we got the, uh, the chopping rotor in the back figured out and we're not wrapping there anymore, we ran the whole 10 acres straight through. Um, so the recommendation is what, what I'll tell you here is if you are going to harvest for grain, you are going to use a combine, I would stop at least every 10 acres, open everything up and take a look, right? Better safe than sorry. I know it kind of stinks to stop every 10 acres, but at least that, uh, maybe more often just to make sure you're not creating that friction situation to where we do burn a combine to the ground, which it has happened. Um, the other thing I'll tell you is that 40 to 60 inch hemp fiber that we left in the field, uh, did lodge under the machine, it caught, it got dragged, we pulled it right out of the ground, and we knocked a sensor loose because of that. Um, I'll show you some pictures in a video here in a minute, but the other recommendation from a safety standpoint I'll make is coming in and out of that combine off of that ladder with 40 to 60 sharp pieces of hemp stubble out there. I'll let your mind work on where those hit me too, but be careful coming off of that combine ladder, okay? They're not uh, forgiving, let's put it that way. So here's what it looked like when we got the chopping rotor wrapped up. Uh, Dr. Mr. Freedy's in there. That, that's uh, one of Kevin Schinner's, um, what do we call that, assistant or, or uh, technician, I should say. So that happened twice, and, and they had it about halfway cleared off. You can see how happy Mr. Freedy is there sitting on a plywood board on the sieves. Um, they started out with, uh, with box cutters. And that will get through it, although it's a little little frustrating. What I would recommend is investing in a battery-powered Sawzall from Milwaukee Tools or otherwise, whatever your favorite brand is. That will that stuff right off of there, okay? Um, but the, the razor knives will work. You just got to sit there and work at it and uh, keep unwrapping, okay? 
So like I said, once that happened on us twice, we turned that chopping rotor speed wide open and, and it didn't happen again throughout the rest of the harvest. Just to show you a little bit about what unloading looks like, this, this grain has a has a outer shell on it, kind of like what sunflower seeds do. So um, we were we were kind of afraid to, to get too rough with that. And, and basically what we did was to minimize the damage by reducing the engine RPM while unloading. So we didn't, normally with corn soybeans, you hear, the, you hear the unloading auger start and you hear the combine operator ram it up to full go. This time we didn't. We left it at a low RPM and just kind of let it churn out of there. And I think that helped quite a bit by uh, by not damaging the seed. To give you an idea what grain cleanliness looked like as it's coming out, that's what we were doing there. Um, it wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but we had a lot less trash in there than what I thought we would. So the settings we used on that combine are, were pretty much right by the time we got finished uh, to keep most of the material, uh, foreign, what do we call it, in, in engineering MOG, MOG material other than grain, out of the, out of the clean grain tanks. So, we did check the, we did, I did put settings up there and they'll be on the presentation, but uh, check them often too, right? So make sure your your fans and other things are, are being adjusted pretty pretty regularly to make sure it keeps it clean, okay? So we did hand measure me yield, that's what I, I told you we did. So we, we looked at the 30 inch rows and the 15 inch rows. And uh, surprisingly enough, the 15 inch rows did really, really well, quite a bit better than 30. So this was five locations across that 10 acre field in each uh, row setting, so 10 total measurements. 30 inch road was about 1,600 pounds per acre on that side, uh, and 15 inch rows was about 2,300 pounds per acre, and that's one standard deviation of both of those. So, um, not <laughs> every time I've given a similar presentation like this, I always have a hand shoot up. Why didn't you plan it on seven and a half? The answer to that is I'm not smart, okay? Um, I picked 15s and 30 thinking I want to use an actual planter to do this someday with a seed plate that'll handle hemp seed. So that's where I was headed. Um, maybe next year we'll get 15 acres and I'll throw, um, throw seven and a half inch rows in there as well. Um, if you do the math there, you'll see that we probably should have harvested about 13,000 pounds. Uh, total we harvested was 8,460. You think I left a little seed in the field? That's a lot of seed in the field. Two things I learned. Birds love it. So if you want to dove hunt or get rid of some pigeons, put a mess of that out, they'll come right to it. The other thing I learned was that you can broadcast this seed and it'll germinate. So when we got done with our harvest, we had a nice little cover crop of small industrial hemp plants out there as well. So I think our germ was pretty good on our, uh, on our harvested seed. I'm not 100% sure of that though, but um, obviously I'm sure it would have killed and we won't have to worry about that next spring. But we did not collect all of the hemp seed that, uh, that we should have. So I put a couple of videos in here. I'm crossing my fingers that they work. Um, if you know what I do in Precision Ag, I have UAVs, so I have them everywhere I go. Um, we'll see, yep, here we go, it's gonna play. So just from view from the top, kind of the machine going through the field, um, you'll be able to see some of the heads wrap around the, wrap around the reel there and fall out the front. Uh, then you can see some of the clean grain going into the going into the elevator or clean grain tank as well. <laughs> 